I'm gonna okay. I'm gonna start out with everybody's favorite uh, version of uh, uh, of chance, which is a coin toss. Okay, so we know that probably if we would cross a coin, we know that the probability of that coin coming up heads is 50%. Okay, so we can all accept that, and we know that if I cross uh, toss a coin a second time, the second coin has no idea what the outcome of the first coin was. So those two events are independent of each other. In other words, if we get a head on the first coin, it's not going to it's not going to influence the probability of getting heads on the second coin. It's still going to be 50% getting heads on that coin. Now, the third coin, not going to know what the first two coins did, so its probability of getting heads is going to be 50% as well. Well, now let's say that instead of uh, 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 tossing them in sequence like that, I toss them all at once, or I toss them in sequence without uh, examining the results right away. And I say to myself, well, gee, what's the probability of getting two, two heads in a row? If the probability of getting one heads is 50%, what's the probability of getting two heads? Somebody can, somebody can contribute to that. What, what is the probability? You can type it into the chat box, right? Probability of uh, heads is, 25%, right, 0. 0.5 times 0. 0.5. And the probability of getting three heads in a row is going to be 0. 0.5 times 0. 0.5 times 0. 0.5, which is 0. 0.125, or about 1 in 8. Okay, so there's a 1 in 8 chance of if you threw three heads, uh, three coins up into the air, them coming down all heads. What's the probability of them coming down all tails? Right, seems pretty simple, right? It's the same thing. 50-50 chance of them being ta tails, so it's going to be 50% as well. Okay, so now let's take a look. At, um, uh, let me look at another possibility also. Let's take a look at a population where 80% of the people in that population are employed. Uh, excuse, well, let's say employed. Let's say insured, employed could be either, either one of those things. I typed out, if you look at the... Uh, 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 the document I opened up, and which is also on Blackboard, uh, I chose insured. It could be employed or whatever. Uh, so you choose one person randomly from the population. And notice I've changed this a little bit. In, in, in statistics and epidemiology, we don't flip coins. Our version of flipping coins is taking a random sample from a population and hoping that that random sample is representative of what the overall population is. For instance, um, if the probability that a person is insured is 80% in a population, if you randomly select one individual from that population, the probability that that person is insured is going to be 80%. Now, based on what we just talked about with the coin flips, what would you say is the probability that three people randomly selected from that population are all insured? Somebody hazard a guess? You don't have to figure it out. You can just... Say how you figure it out. Numbers, right? 0.8 is the probability. 0.8 times 0.8 times 0.8 is going to be the probability that three people chosen at random from that population are are, are insured. Uh, now, those are all. Each one of those sa samples is an independent event. Okay, it doesn't influence the other sample. We chose three of them. Now, keep in mind, this kind of selection may not always be an independent event. For instance, if we chose um, uh, um, if we chose uh, uh, two out of three people that we chose are married people, right? Well, a lot of people whose spouses are insured have insurance based because their spouse has. So it's more likely if we happen to be choosing married people that you'd get a higher percentage of insured. Okay, so well, just see what that is. It's going to be 0 0.8 times 0.8 times 0.8. Okay, probability of getting three people insured is going to be a little bit better than 50%. Okay, and that's because so many people in that population are insured. Okay, so now it, it's not always going to be independent events. As I said, they, you might have situations where you have your 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 selection is not really random, such as um, if you're sampling a group that has uh, 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 many married people in it. Uh, uh, you know, that's a good question. That's another case. Now, if it's a very large, but Daniela asks, uh, if we're assuming that we're reintroducing the people chosen back into the pool of people that we're going to pick, 
Well, if it's a very large population, it's not going to have a significant impact. But obviously, for instance, if I gave you a situation where there was a red sock and a blue sock in a draw, and you reached in in the dark and pulled one out, it turned out to be a blue sock. Well, the next, if we don't put that sock back, the next election is definitely going to be a red sock, right? So, so they're no longer independent events. Okay, so in some cases, when it's a small population, you might have to reintroduce that person or that uh, object or thing back into the population to make sure it's still an independent event. Or maybe it's not an independent event because of how you've, you've affected that. Okay, card playing is like that. For instance, uh, you know, if you're playing blackjack or something like that, and, and, and a lot of heads have already, a lot of uh, uh, face cards have already been played, people know that they can kind of count face cards and, and, and get a little bit of an edge on the house because it's no longer, uh, the probabilities have changed because what's in the deck is no longer representative of what a full, what a normal full deck might be. So it acts, exactly. These are the kinds of things that we deal with when we're looking uh, at uh, uh, probabilities like this. Okay, so now what's the probability that you choose three people randomly and none of them are insured? If it, uh, remember that the probability of a person that's insured is 80%. What's the probability that you take three people randomly from this population and that none of the three people that you pick uh, at random are insured? Anybody want to hazard a guess on what that probability is? No, I got 8%. Well, let's see. How would I figure that out? Well, the probability that someone is insured is 80%. The probability that someone is not insured in this population is 20%. Okay, so not insured, the complement of insured or not insured is 20%. So probability the first person is insured is 0.2 times 0.2 times 0.2. And indeed, it's it's 0.8%. Uh, okay, so right point. Okay, good. We all seem to have gotten it, gotten the idea on that, right? So pretty simple when we're working with independent events. Well, now, let's say that uh, we want to take a look at this a little bit more closely. It's, a, it's pretty easy. We just multiply PA times PA times PA, the probability of these events occurring each time that we did this, and, and things worked out pretty well. Well, now I'm going to take our coin toss, and I'm going to take a closer look at it, except this time I'm not going to assume that all of the probabilities, uh, that all of, the, all of these coins are going to be very nicely come up with, come up as heads for us. Okay, I'm going to, I'm going to, make this a li little bit more involved. Okay, I'm going to say to myself, let me get right with here. Oh, one direction. Okay, let me get this back. Okay, so I'm going to say to myself, I'm going to, I'm going to cross one coin, and I have two possibilities. The first coin could be heads, or the first coin could be tails. Well, now, I've tossed the coin its heads, and we know we know that this is not going to influence the uh, outcome in the next coin. So the next coin, after I toss heads, it's going to be either heads or tails as well. Well, for that first coin that I tossed, I'm going to move this down here. First coin that I tossed, if it had come out tails, well, the second coin could come out heads, or it could come out tails. Well, each one of these outcomes has two possible outcomes for the third coin, heads or tails, and heads, or tails, and heads, or tails, and heads, or tails. Okay, so let's take a look at this. Each one of these, the probability of getting heads after we toss this first coin is going to be 50%. The probability of, probability of getting heads to begin with is 50%. Probability of getting heads again is 50%. So all of these different possibilities are all 50%, all of these different outcomes. Okay, well, let's see, since we know since they're independent events, we can multiply them. Well, the probability of getting three heads is gonna be 0.5 times 0.5 times 0.5. That's gonna be equal to 0 0.125. Probability of getting heads, let's see, heads, 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 and tails is gonna be 0.125. The probability of getting heads Tails, heads is going to be 0.125. Probability of getting head, first coin heads, second coin tails, third coin tails is 0 0.125. And you can see a pattern at, at, occurring here. They're all going to be 0.125. They're all going to be, each outcome 
is going to be a one in eight chance of that occurring. Okay, and believe me, I can make you guys great gamblers, maybe never quite winning gamblers, maybe not losing quite so badly gamblers. If we uh, 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 spend enough time looking at this and doing the same thing with dice for the craps table and cards for the blackjack table and so on and so forth. So let's take a look at what happened here. Probability of getting three heads is one in eight. None of these other outcome include three heads. So three heads, uh, the probability is just as we predicted, 0.5 times 0.5 times, is going to be uh, 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 one in eight or 0 0.0125. Probability of getting three tails, just as we predicted, is going to be 0 0.0125. Well, let's look at, look at these other possibilities. Heads, heads, tails. Let's see, that's two heads. Let's see, heads, tails, heads. That's two heads. Heads, tails, tails. That's one head. Um, 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 tails, heads, heads. That's two heads. Uh, tail, heads, tails. That's one head. Tails, tails, heads. That's one head. And we got we got all tails and, and so on and so forth. Okay, so what's the probability of tossing three coins and getting three heads? Well, let's say I'm getting two heads. Excuse me, getting two heads. Okay, what, well, where does that occur? It can occur here, it can occur here, it can occur here. So three, there's, uh, there's, it's one in eight chance, one in eight chance, so it's three out of eight chance where the probability is 0.375. Well, how do I know I can add all these together? Well, all of these different probabilities are, represent all the possible outcomes for tossing three coins. One of these three, one of these eight sequences is going to occur if we toss these three coins. So if I add up all these probabilities, 0 0.0125, 0 0.0125, and so on and so forth, if I all add them all up, it's going to be equal to one. It's going to cover all of the possible outcomes. Probability of getting three tails, two heads, two tails. Well, let's see where we have two tails. Two tails, same thing as getting one head. One, two, three. It's also 0.375. Okay, so we have a way, we have a, a, a we now have a tool to do some basic prediction about independent events. We can multiply them out when we know what the uh, probabilities are, uh, and we can add them together uh, when we know the outcomes of those independent events and uh, if they if they uh, are exclusive. Okay, and these are, you know, this is one way you can get an outcome, this is another way you can get an outcome, another way, and so on and so forth. So I'm going to take a look at another another way of looking at this, and that is, okay, let's say that um, 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 we did this, we we did this with the three. Now let's say we did this with the three people that were uh, 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 insured. Well, what would happen with uh, with the uh, uh, three people insured is instead of heads or tails, we're going to be insured or not insured. We're going to be insured or not insured. The only difference is, is that the probability of being insured is going to be 0.8, and the probability of not being insured is going to be 0.2. So probability of being insured again is going to be 0.8. Probability of not being insured is going to be 0.2. Uh, so on and so forth, all through this different sequence, the probability of being not insured, not insured, and not insured is going to be 0.2 times 0.2 times 0.2. Well, we know that 0.2 times 0.2 is we multiply that out and it gives us the probability that we're uh, that we predict three people and they're not insured. We did that before. We did it for insured, three people that were all insured. You want to calculate the probability for all these others. Well, uh, then we can just calculate, well, uh, uh, for two people, insured, not insured, insured, not insured, insured, it's going to be 0.2 times uh, 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 0.2, excuse me, 0 0.8 times 0 0.2 times not insured again is going to be 0.2. We can calculate a probability for that outcome. All of these will add up to one again, and we can figure out what's the probability for two people out of three that are uninsured or one person that's uninsured. We're going to get into this later on in the semester in much more detail. But you can see that if we're dealing with a simple example, it's pretty easy to lay this out and get a pretty good idea of what's going on with the probabilities 
of these uh, these pairs of choices, these yes no choices, insured not insured, um, uh, 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 heads heads uh, coin flip to the heads or coin flip to the tail, uh, diabetic not diabetic, and so on and so forth. Uh, these play, these uh, situations where we're looking at chance and where we're uh, 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 dealing with two possible outcomes are called binomial. And we're not going to worry about that too much for tonight, but keep that in mind because we're going to be looking at probabilities, independence, uh, whether or not things are exclusive and so on and so forth. We're going to be, as we go through tonight, we're going to be continuing to look at this. But in the back of our minds, we're going to say to ourselves, well, this is a very simple situation. What if I'm choose, What if I'm sampling 20 people out of a population, and uh, some of them are diabetic, some of them are not diabetic, right? What's the probability of me getting three diabetics out of that 20 people in a population? That's going to come up. We're going to learn ways to do that without having to build a tree that's like it, you know going to take up 12 pieces of paper and be impossible for us to calculate. Okay, so we're going to move on from that and take a look at another example. But before we do that, I want to I want to uh, propose one interesting thing about this. Okay, let's say that um, uh, we sample three people randomly in this population for insurance. We decided that the probability that they would be insured is going to be 0.8 times 0.8 times 0.8. So the probability that all three are insured is going to be about, I think it was about 51%. Okay, let's say that you actually go out and do an exercise. You take, you sample three people at random from the population and you write down how many of them insured. You sample three more people. You do that a thousand times. So you have an enormous sample of repeatedly sampling three people. Okay, and instead of getting 51%, right, let's say that you found that 75% of the time that, that they were insured. What does that suggest to you? about one of your initial assumptions when we did this. Okay, what would you, we expected to get 51% of the time getting of these thousand times or about 510 times. We expected to get the three people that were insured and 490 times we expected to get two insured or one insured or none insured out of the three. If we got 75%, what does that suggest to you about our original assumption about this population? Somebody want to hazard a guess? What's it not? What do we say it had to be to multiply the probabilities? Each event had to be what from the next event? I know you know it. We said the word about 10 times tonight. Right, exactly. If they don't multiply out, in other words, if you don't get that result, that indeed, that the real probability of getting three people that were insured is not, doesn't turn out to be 51%, it turns out to be something different, like 75%, then the then it wasn't really, then this this is really not independent probabilities. And like I said, one of the reasons could be that maybe it, uh, it was convenient to sample people coming in. Maybe the, the study was done, they sampled people coming out of a department store. So they anytime they saw a group of three people or the first three people they saw coming out, uh, they sampled in the next three and they waited for a while and they took three people. Well, there's a good chance that husband and wife are, are shopping together. And there's a good chance that if one of them has insurance, they both have insurance. So maybe it isn't really a random sample. And maybe these samples are not really random. This is a good test to see if it's random. You can only multiply these probabilities if uh, in a situation where you want to uh, uh, predict the outcome that all of them have that property if they're independent. Okay? So I, we beat that to death. Uh, it's going to come up again uh, uh, in the future. Uh, or it's going to come up again tonight, as a matter of fact, but we're going to move on from this. this these documents that I'm opening are on Blackboard if you want to go to them later on. Uh, but for the time being, I'd suggest mainly that you consider just uh, uh, following what we're doing. I just wanted to check the email there just to make sure that we weren't getting any uh, students that were having problems logging on. So, okay, so a, a sound and, and video is still good, no problem. Somebody volunteer? Okay, good. Just wanted to make sure. Um, okay, let's see. What, uh, 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 they want to do that again. Uh, let me get back to my Word documents. Oh, that's not the one I want. Oops. Hmm. 
Okay, take a look at this. Now, one of the other documents I put in there um, uh, it illustrates what we were just doing. And this is a, um, uh, I'm not going to go over this in too much detail because it's kind of beat it to death already. Probability that all three ran the, this is students who chose a, a series of three multiple choice questions and the probability that uh, they get it right. Uh, if they're multiple choice, they have no idea what the answers are. And there's five answers, right? Five possible answers, A, B, C, D, E, right? Well, chance of getting it right, if you just guess, is going to be, uh, uh, tw uh, it's going to be uh, uh, 0.2, 20%. So the probability of getting all three right, it's going to be like our coin flip uh, or our insurance going to be 0.2 times 0.2 times 0.2, probability of getting all three wrong. And these are all the different probabilities. These will all add up to one as it did for the coin flips. Okay. Um, and then if you want to play with this later on uh, as an exercise, if you want to make it a little bit more challenging, you can say to yourself, well, the probability that students were getting the first question right is 80 percent probability to get second question correct is 50 percent probability to get the third question is 90 percent all that you can alter this table and see how this knowledge of the rate that they get uh, overall they get these questions right might affect the outcomes to these okay so i'm going to move on from, I don't, i'm not going to kill that okay and let's go to let's see what i can do next here Okay, now let's take a look at data the way that we might be able to, that we might be presented with it in epidemiological study. Okay, in this case, um, uh, um, uh, the, this is a, uh, based on um, uh, a census, right? This represents uh, the entire population in the United States. This is a population study. It's not a, um, a sample. Uh, each one of these numbers represents uh, millions of people, uh, represents a total of 214 million people. Uh, this is probably uh, based on numbers from, say, maybe 20 or 30 years ago or something like that, you know, because that's around what the population was then. I guess now it's like well over 300 million. Okay. And uh, back then it was 214 million. And um, uh, uh, the, the results of the census have been organized into a table. In the table, we have rows, okay, and the rows represent the gender, okay, male, female, and we have columns. The columns represent the marital status of all the people that were surveyed in, in the census, okay. This is a common way to, to organize data. Uh, what kind of data is organized this way? What, what kind of data is this? Male and female are in rows, and marital status, single married, uh, widowed, and divorced, are in columns, both of these variables, gender and marital status. So what kind of variables? Nominal, great. Uh, sometimes you call it categorical, they're names, right? So so they're not numerical, right? Even though there's numbers in it, they're actually, these numbers are actually frequencies. 29,700,000 uh, people were single, males were single in this population. These are nominal variables. It's just organized into a table. The numbers in here are actually frequencies. Okay, so now um, I'm looking at this table, and it's very common to organize stuff this way. In SPSS and a lot of statistical calculations, they refer to this as cross tabs, cross tabs, cross tabulation, or cross tab tables. Very frequently, they use them for disease studies. When they use them for disease studies, they put the exposure in the rows, and they put the outcome in the uh, columns. This is not quite like this, right? Because well, maybe maybe gender is an exposure for different things. But in this case, you know, uh, 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 I'm not sure we can apply that very well. But again, in the future, you're going to see that uh, most often these tables are exposure and in the columns, uh, uh, their outcomes like disease or not disease. Uh, in the rows, it might be uh, for instance, exposure might be um, uh, 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 obesity, yes or no. And in the columns, it might be diabetes, yes, disease, yes, disease, no. And you'd have a two by two table in a situation like this. This is actually a two by four table. But we're just going to use, it's really just used to organize data. We're going to find that it's a very good tool 
for uh, 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 predicting or use or or, uh, or working with data as well. Okay, let's say that I ask you if one person is randomly selected from the population uh, uh, that's described above the United States population in this particular year. Uh, actually, this is a population 18 years and older. So actually, the total population might have been like 250 or higher. That might be more recent than I thought. Find the probability. Uh, if you randomly select one person. What's the probability that that person is divorced? Somebody has a guess? What's the probability that in this population that a person is divorced? Okay. How many people are divorced in this population? Well, notice we have to, we have nine male, nine million males are divorced. Twelve point seven females are divorced. Good. I like uh, great. A, a bunch of you are getting way ahead of me here. I love when you get ahead of me. Okay. So the total number of people that are divorced is twenty one point seven out of the total number of people in the population, which is two fourteen. So the probability that a person is divorced is going to be exactly twenty one point seven divided by 214. I'm going to round it. I'm not going to bother with the decimal places for our purposes right now. Okay. What's the probability that a person is male in this population? Okay. Let's see if we can't get you get useful information in this table. Let's see how many people in this population are male. Well, it's male single, male married. Right? We'll put all of the males. There's 104.9 million males out of the total population is 100 and so on and so forth. Right. Great. Thank you very much. I love when you get ahead of me like that. I, as I said, so it's basically 105 over 214, right? Okay, now let's get a little bit trickier here. What's the probability that a person is both male and a widower? Okay, well, let's see. Person male and a widower, there's only one condition that uh, uh, satisfies that. There's only one box here that satisfies that. Male widower, this is female widower, doesn't qualify. That's male widower. 2.7 million males are widowed, uh, are widowers in the United States out of a total population of 214. So the probability that if you randomly select a person from the population of the United States, right, 1%, right, 2.7 over 214, which is roughly about 1%. Okay, so what did we just do there? In the lecture, you use the term for when two conditions had to occur at the same time. Anybody remember what that term was? In other words, uh, uh, they, you were both widowed and male. You met both those conditions. Uh, okay, conditional. Uh, how about when you looked at your Venn diagrams? What did you say about uh, when uh, the probability of being male and the probability of being female occurred at the same time in a Venn diagram. They intersected, right? 2.7 million is the intersection of the probability of being male and the probability of being female. This is the intersection of the probability of being male and being female. Okay. Uh, being widowed, excuse me, male and female, that, being widowed. Okay. So, that, so we're kind of tying this table into calculations that we're going to be doing later on. Okay. Given that a person is male, What's the probability that he's married? That statement has a kind of a ring for certain kinds of probabilities that you were just listening to, particularly at the, at the end of the lecture. Uh, somebody already figured it out, right? Let's see, probability of person, uh, I'm going to figure out the number. First of all, what's the probability that a person is married? Well, there's 126 uh, uh, million married people in the United States. What's the probability that the person is married, that's male, Given that he's married, well, oh, excuse me, did I do that backwards? Given that, given that a person is male, okay, given that he's male, he's going to be in this column, what's the probability that he's married? Okay, well, that looks like it's going to be 63.5 over the total number of people that are married, 126. Okay, so in other words, the condition here was he's male to start off with. So we're only going to deal, deal with males. So what's the pro? Oh, I just did that wrong, didn't I? And none of you caught me. What did I just do wrong? It's actually 63 over 104. Okay, so so Bliss got that right. A bunch of you got that right. But I got it wrong. I'm going to make believe I got it wrong on purpose, right? Okay, so, so that to, to illustrate what I did wrong here. Okay, let's see. What did I do wrong here? Given that a person is male. 
we start with the assumption that this person is male. So we're only going to deal with the people in the, in the top row. Thank you. We're only going to deal with the people in the top row. Uh, it's, trust me, it's twice as embarrassing when I post this and the mistake's still there. That's one downside of like recording these things. Right? If we start with the uh, given that the person is male and we look to see, well, within that group that are male, g- given that you're male, let's so we'll narrow this down to 104.9 million people. Given that, uh, what's the probability that you're married in male? 63.5 over 104. And what kind of probability is that? In other words, it's based on a condition that's already satisfied that you're male. Okay, somebody want to uh, tell me what kind of condi- that's a conditional probability? There you go. That's. I'd like to say that's as complicated as this gets, but we're going to make it more complicated later on. You know, so that you know, uh, just make it worth taking this course. But it's but we're going to make it a little bit more complicated because we're going to use it in ways that help us do other calculations. But that's what conditional probability really means. Is what's the problem? Uh, what's the probability of being married? Is 126 out of 214, right? That's the number of married people out of uh, uh, the total population. What's the probability of being married? Given that you're male, says that we're only that we're only going to look at the condition that male has already been satisfied. That you have to be male. That that's the only population that we're dealing with. What's the probability now that they're married? 63 over 104. Okay, so that's what conditional probability is all about. Condition, we're going to look, we're going to end up tonight with an important example of conditional probability when we look at uh, our diagnostic tests. Okay, so I'm going to move on from this. And okay, uh, like I said, this is available on Blackboard if you want to download it. Uh, let me see, let me see, let me see, let me see. Okay, I'm going to open up this Excel spreadsheet. This Excel spreadsheet was produced by Ari, uh, 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 Ali rather, uh, 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 the lab instructor in in uh, in uh, uh, for sections one and uh, for sections one and two, and um, you have an opportunity. One of the nice things about recording these sessions, having multiple labs, and so on and so forth, you have an opportunity to be exposed to this material three different ways. You can get Ali's, uh, Ali's version of it. You can get my version of it. You can get, you can get Pro, uh, Professor Waldron's version of it. You have a lot of exposure to this presented a bit differently. So, I, and all of this is available to all of us. So, you know, even though we're in different sections and we split up for these and we have things kind of segregated a little bit uh, in, uh, uh, in the uh, uh, Blackboard course, feel free, don't. You know, you go. You can go into the other section, zero one, zero two, just as people in zero one, uh, zero zero one, and zero zero two can go into uh, our lecture and take a look at it and see if they maybe works better for them. And trust me, what's going to happen is is that many of you will see what I present and be confused by it, and then look at uh, Ali's version of the same thing and say, "What? Well, gee, that's a lot clearer to me." You know, and and a lot of it may just have to be with the way uh, way it's presented. Some of it may be just the way that, that you're used to thinking or receiving the information. So I encourage you to take a look at this from a couple of perspectives. Okay, so I'm going to take a look at this now. Now, we have here um, uh, data from SPSS. I'm going to open SPSS. Um, you know, some questions have come up. For instance, right now, I'm going to go over here. I'm going to open up this uh, the data file that we've been playing with SPSS rocks. <laughs> Thank you very much. That's very cute. Um, uh, I'm going to open up the uh, data file that we've been working with that North Carolina birth data, which is really uh, you know thou- tens of thousands of uh, 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 results of of cases of of individual births that were tracked in North Carolina uh, some ten years ago or something like that. And I'm going to open that in SPSS if I can find it. Let me see. I think I have it here somewhere. I don't think I have it in the folder up here. <laughs> Let's get this out of the way. Right, let me do this this way. It's not. And session. Where is it? Did it go? 
excuse me for a moment while I stumble around here. Oh, we were all already organized by date. And why didn't I find it? Did I hide it somewhere? No. Wait a moment, I'll get to it. There it is. Okay, let's see if I got the data file in here. There we go. I'm going to double click on this. It'll automatically open up SPSS. Okay, you can, if you want, start from SPSS. Use the uh, uh, bra use your browser from SPSS from open data and then browse for the file that you want to work with. Make sure that the type of file that it's looking for is the kind that you have on your computer or it won't see it. It filters out, uh, for instance, if it's looking for Excel files, it will filter out everything but Excel files. Looking for SPSS files, it'll filter out all the other fonts. You won't see them as available. Uh, I must have clicked on this a couple of times. I opened it twice. Okay, so here's our data. And our data has, um, uh, 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 we have gender, we have the mother's age, we have marital status, we have um, uh, 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 whether the person is Hispanic or non-Hispanic uh, uh, mother, uh, race of the mother, so on and so forth. We know in our variable view, each one of these, each one of these rows represents a case of birth, a child that was born, okay, and has all data about the birth weight and so on and so forth. Um, and each one of these columns represents a variable, uh, weeks of gestation, uh, the amount of weight that the mother gained, whether or not the mother smoked and so on and so forth. So we're starting to get familiar with this data set. And it's called 800 because we randomly selected, as best we could, we randomly selected 800 cases from the entire data set of tens of thousands, okay? And the reason why we did that was just simply to make this a little bit more manageable for our purposes, control the file size, make it a little bit more workable. However, everything that we're doing here with 800 cases, we could have done with 25,000 cases, virtually uh, uh, the same, literally the same process and, and almost as easily, okay? so. What I want to do now is is that I'm interested in comparing the uh, 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 the race of the mother, okay, to the gender of the child, okay. I want to see what's the probability uh, that uh, a Hispanic mother might have a uh, female child versus um, uh, some other group that might be under uh, the race of the mother. So I need to organize that. I need to count that. I need to organize that into a table. And as I mentioned, a lot of times we refer to these tables, these rows and columns as cross tabs. And you guys, some of you guys may have already noticed, but if you go into analyze and you go into descriptive statistics, one of the, one of the elements we, we already played around with frequencies, descriptives, explore. The next element is cross tabs. I'm going to click on that. Now, cross tabs comes up with a uh, box that asks us, well, which variables do you want to work with here? And notice we have rows and we have columns. If we were dealing with an exposure, well, then, you know, gee, an exposure, we might want to say, well, what is, what am I looking for? What's the likelihood that uh, different ethnicities would have different outcomes in terms of gender? So our exposure, if you want to call it that, is likely to be the race of the mother. The outcome that we're looking for is the sex of the child. So this is going to be in my rows, and this is going to be in my columns. Notice I get this funny little uh, red, blue, yellow uh, ball thing over here. Anybody know what that red, blue, yellow ball thing stands for in SPSS? It's, it's actually the variable type, right? It means it's a nominal variable. It's a name. Sex, sex is male or female. Race of the mother is Hispanic, non-Hispanic, uh, black, white, so on and so forth. Um, uh, you'll notice that the numerical variables have little rulers next to them, right? Really quaint and cute, right? So now there's a whole bunch of options that I have here. I can click on statistics. We're getting ahead of ourselves here, but we're not going to do any statistics on it. Some of this stuff may, these names, chi-square and stuff like that, correlation, sounds awful familiar to you. We're not going to play with that right now. Right now, we just want to format this table. I'm going to click on cells. Cells gives me a bunch of options here, rows, percentages, and stuff like that. I'm not worried about percentages right now. I just want it to organize this table 
based on the observed values, the counts of the uh, mothers in the different ethnic groups, the counts of the mothers, the counts of the number of male and female babies that have been born. So I'm just going to leave that one thing uh, checked off, and I'm going to click OK. SPSS uh, goes through its process. Notice that it produces a text file which describes the process it just went through. It got this file, it opened this file, and see birth 800 mod. Um, uh, it uh, did this process on it. It produced cross tabs, ta table, uh, which is going to have race of the mother by the gen sex or gender of the baby. It's going to do counts in the cells. It's, that's all it's going to do uh, because we didn't add on any of these other processes. Okay, finishes the case processing summary. It, it found 800 cases, none missing. There was no data, data missing. And look what it found here. It found the number of white, black, American Indian, Chinese, Filipino, and so on and so forth. Um, I noticed that, well, hang on a second. Let me see if there's another variable there that's the race of the mother also. Scriptors, explore. I'm gonna go to cross tabs again. And I'm gonna move that back. And da, ba, ba. Uh, mother of histor uh, Hispanic origin. Any other race, please? I'm gonna put that in there and do it again. Why did I do that? I'm going to get a different table. Okay, I'm going to get a different table. Uh, and here's the table I'm going to get, and it organized it. In the rows, um, uh, it asked whether the, the mother was Hispanic or non-Hispanic, um, um, uh, and so on and so forth. Um, and the reason why I'm doing this is because that allows us to very quickly organize this data into tables. Now, if I go back to the Excel spreadsheet that I had, and I think I may have a problem here. Let's see. I'm going to open up this Excel spreadsheet that we were just glancing at. Let's look at it open here. Here somewhere. Nope, that's not it. I keep opening that. Let's see. Where my Excel spreadsheet? I must have closed it. Okay. Let's reopen it. Oh, it's already open. Oh, here it is right here. I pulled it right up into the front. Okay, ethnicity. Do we have a do we have a variable for ethnicity? Well, let's see. I'm going to do this again. Analyze, uh, uh, descriptive statistics, cross tabs. Is there an ethnicity variable? Ah, oh, here we go. Ethnicity. All right. I'm going to use that one instead. Now I'm not sure how that's different than race of the mother, but I'm going to use a variable ethnicity instead. Okay, that, and ethnicity is going to have various values and so on and so forth. And then we're about to produce our third table uh, of the ones that we want. And bingo, that's the one I want. Okay, and all it did was it went through there and it counted how many male children were there. Well, there are a total of 418. How many female children? 182. Uh, how many of those were Hispanic? How many of them were non-Hispanic black, non-Hispanic white? How many of them were other? That's Pacific Islanders, so on and so forth. Okay, and it calculated that. What's the total number of uh, non-Hispanic? 523. This is very much like the table that we looked at before that had two rows and four columns where we started to make some predictions about probabilities. Uh, this number here uh, is the number of non-Hispanic black uh, uh, mothers, okay, and they had eight uh, that had male children. This is the total number of mothers. So you can see the probability in this study of a non Hispanic black of uh, randomly selecting someone from this study and uh, being that being a male non Hispanic black woman who had a male child is going to be 87 out of uh, 800. So that's the probability of selecting that particular race and gender together, okay, for the child and the mother. Okay, so this is a lot like that table that we just looked at before. We organized it almost instantly. We, don't, we did an instant count of all of these things. Now, we've transferred that information. See, it's the same table here. Let me see if I can put them side by side so you can actually see. Okay, if we look at this, I'm going to move something so I can see it. If we look at this, let's see, 272, 87, 44, 15, 418. You can see that. We've just copied that same table to uh, 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 this uh, Excel spreadsheet. Okay, now I'm going to get started on this. 
And I'm going to get started on, on working with this table. But uh, Ali has put up a about a uh, 55 minute long review and calculation, a review of calculations and probabilities based on this table that goes into an enormous amount of detail. Okay, so I'm going to I'm going to work with this for a little bit, but I'm going to suggest that when you really get into this, that you go to Ali's uh, video, which is now under session three for sections one and two, and you play Ali's video and, and you go through this in quite a bit more detail. For instance, uh, one of the things that he does is uh, he looks at non-Hispanic white females and male babies. So the sample space, that's the intersection of non-Hispanic white females and male babies. Well, what's the probability that you would select for, randomly from this population a non-Hispanic white female uh, with a male baby? Let's see, non-Hispanic white. There were 272 male babies born to non-Hispanic white females. So the probability that you would choose that in this population is going to be 272 over 800. Okay, the probability that that, that uh, you would choose a non-Hispanic white female who had a female baby is 251 over 800. Okay, probably a better way to do this is to actually to click in. I'm just going to do one more. Non-Hispanic black and male baby is 87 out of 800 and so on and so forth. All of these represent probability of that specific occurrence, okay, that individual occurrence. What do you guys think that when I add this all together, what do you think that the total probability is going to be if I add all these probabilities together, right? I'm, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to calculate every possible outcome. It's going to be one exactly right. I haven't done it yet, so it's, it's, it hasn't. This is a, this box. If we look at this formula, that's the sum of all these boxes. So it's filling in and starting to count up, and it'll complete as we finish this up. Okay, now let's take a look at another way of looking at this, at this thing. Okay, what's the probability of having a male baby? Well, the probability of having a male baby, let's see, how many male babies is 418 out of 800 total births? The probability of a male baby is going to be equal to 418 over 800. Probability of having a female baby is going to be, well, 382 out of 800. Makes sense, right? Because the baby's going to be either male or female, so these two probabilities are going to add up to uh, uh, one. Probability of having a Hispanic baby is going to be equal to, okay, it's going to be equal to, uh, let's see, there's 82 Hispanic mothers divided by, uh, uh, let's see, uh, uh, all the babies would be 800. And the probability of getting be, uh, of having a non-Hispanic mother. Well, all of these three groups are non-Hispanic mothers. So if the probability of having a Hispanic mother is 0.10, probability of having a non-Hispanic mother is going to be 0 0.90. I could actually add these three uh, other groups together, uh, uh, the 523, 168, and the 27, put that over 800, and I'll get the same answer as I got there. Okay, so now... Now, let's say, let's take a look at this. I, I let the uh, variable the uh, variable E denote the event that the child is female, given that the mother is Hispanic. Okay, so what do we start with there? We're starting with the fact that the mother is Hispanic. So we're only dealing with these particular births, these 82 births. What's the probability that the child is female if the mother is Hispanic. Well, in that case, it's going to be 38 over 82. Okay, and again, that kind of probability is a conditional probability. What, what we're doing is, is we're looking for the probability of a female baby, given that we already know that the mother is Hispanic. So the probability of that baby being female is now, con is, is now conditional. It can only be uh, we're only dealing with Hispanic mothers. Okay, so we're going to, the other thing we're going to look at is, is that when these events occur, some of them are independent of each other. They can't occur at the same time. 
okay? And you played around with some Venn diagrams. There's a couple of Venn diagrams right here. The probability on a coin toss is uh, of getting heads is 50%. Probability of getting tails is 50%. It, on any individual coin toss, you either get heads or you get tails. You can't get both, right, on any one individual coin toss. So the probability of getting a head is 50%. Probability of getting a tail is 50%. The probability of getting a, a head and a tail on one choice is zero. The probability of getting uh, uh, something that's both heads and tails uh, on uh, is is zero. Okay, so now what's the probability of, let's say, we have something that's not uh, uh, disjoint or uh, uh, or things that can occur together. Let's take a look at this. Probability of having blue eyes in a population is 25%. Probability of having red hair in that population is 10%. I put these numbers down here as 25 and 10 because you can almost look at this as maybe 25 people out of 100 or 10 people out of 100. Let's say I told you that out of those 100 people or 100% of the population, that three of them have both blue eyes and red hair. Okay. What's going to happen here is, is that you have an area here where these two groups overlap. And in this group, in this uh, uh, area where they overlap, is the intersection of red hair and blue eyes, right? So if I were to ask you, um, 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 let's see if I have some an example here. Um, um, what's the, let's see, the probability of A intersection B, in other words, having blue eyes and red hair, is 3%. Uh, what's the, what's the uh, probability of having blue eyes or red hair, okay, blue eyes and red, blue eyes or red hair, both of those conditions satisfy uh, 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 this outcome, okay, what's the probability that someone would have blue eyes, red hair, or both, in other words, this whole thing here, okay, anybody without looking at the formula, anybody want to tell me what the probability that, that uh, you would pick somebody randomly out of this population, and they would have uh, either blue eyes or red hair or both, Okay, anybody uh, have a guess at that? Is it going to be 30? Let me ask you this. Is it 35? Is 35 the right answer? Give me a yes or no. Somebody give me a yes or no. 35 the right answer. See, now I'm baiting you, aren't I? Because I know that's the wrong. We know that's the wrong answer, don't we? Okay. The reason why we know that's the wrong answer is because there's three people in here. That means that there are three people that satisfy both conditions. Okay. So really, we have really outside of here, people that have only blue eyes but not red hair is 22. People that have red hair and don't have blue eyes is really only seven. So we have 25, 22 and seven plus the three that are in here. Or in other words, we have 32% of the population has uh, 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 blue eyes or red hair. Okay, that's our union of blue eyes and red probability of blue eyes and red hair well probability of the union uh, blue eyes and red hair is equal to the probability of a which is 25 percent plus the probability of b which is 10 percent minus the area where they overlap which is three percent so this formula represents a way a notation must indicate what's happening here so 25 plus 10 minus the 3% that's overlapped, that's already been counted in one of these or the other, right? So we have to subtract it, okay? So are you guys okay with that? I, I suddenly got a lot of silence here, so I'm a little concerned. You can still hear me, and you're reasonably okay with that. Yes, please? Say yes. Okay, good. All right. I'm feeling a little bit better now. I was getting a little worried there. Okay, now, there's many other examples that Ali goes on to, and I certainly suggest you go ahead and like take a look at uh, the, uh, you know, how he continues with this. And he gets, it gets a little complicated, right? I'm not sure you have to go into quite as much depth as he goes here for the exam when we get to it eventually, but I think you'll benefit from listening to the rest of this. Um, uh, yeah, there's an answer, there, there's an answer key uh, uh, um, uh, for his uh, worksheet. Uh, I took out, well, in fact, I made this up by taking the answers out. The one that you're looking at right now, that's my version. 
um, his version has the answer to. I'll make sure it's posted. You can find it in his in in ses his session three, um, uh, uh, or I'll post it in our area too in case you have some trouble finding it. So, but I encourage you to go to that. Now, Ali didn't uh, go into diagnostic testing in this particular video, and you know I want to go to that now because we really need to cover that, and all this is going to kind of tie in together in terms of probabilities. So I'm going to get this out of the way for now. And I'm going to go to 